I'm going to give you a form which I need you to complete not now and, and preferably don't even read it now, please. But it's going to be a, a score thing. So what we're going to do is we usually weigh people before a weight loss program and we're all very used to it. We've been doing it since the 70s and Weight Watchers has taught us beautifully how to watch weight. We realize completely now that watching people's weight is one of the really least important ways of determining if what you're doing is working and one of the least important ways of determining if it's actually successful. So what this score form is going to do for you is it's going to plot you across a number of areas. We'll chat about that and it's going to give you a score which you're going to add up for me. I just want to make sure that you heard that part. Please add it up for me. So it's going to have different sections and I want you to total it at the end and that's going to be how you decide if this is working or not working. Your weight, you will notice on there, is a very small component of the overall picture. And next week we're going to divide you into groups which uh, we will then compete against each other but we won't compete with weight. We're going to compete with scores. So I want to see who gets the healthiest over the next 12 weeks, not who gets the thinnest. And the reason I've decided is there's not enough fat people for me to get famous. I need to get to the thin people too. <laughs> so we need, it, it's been an old thing of doctors. Yeah, the problem with doctors is we can only charge sick people. So imagine how cool it would be if you could charge healthy people too. Don't you think? So... Um, this is my aim in life. Eventually, I'll have achieved my goal when I've managed to charge everybody. One account goes out on a day, and that's it. End of the... Thank you very much. It was lovely being here. Because the healthy people is actually where we should be doing our most work. Because the best opportunity we have of saving your life is catching you while you're still well. Once the stuff starts going on, we start losing it. You really start hanging on by your claws. And we can do so much before we get to that point. We can do so much even after that point if we do it properly. But really the message should be to, to thick and thin, healthy and sick to make the real differences that we want to make. So we'll run through some of the stuff. Some of the stuff I talked about last week. Uh, some I uh, think fell out. I just want to check this is right way around. Don't anybody leave, please. Right. Bet Your Life. We've talked about the four E's of Bet Your Life. We're talking, uh, we have a program in development now called the 4E Lifestyle Program. And it's based on the four E's which you will go through with me, of which the first one is tonight, which is your evaluation form. That's how we differentiate between the different people and we decide what your end point or goal is. It doesn't have to be weight loss. It's cute if it's weight loss. It's nice if it's weight loss, but it's not the main goal. We're going to talk about eliminating foods that you don't need, enlightening, and we're going to ultimately try and get you to a place where you live a balanced lifestyle going forward and try to explain to you what that is and what the expectation of that is these days because most people don't know. We're going to evaluate you um, a little some hiccups with the slides there. So what let's talk about Betcha Life. I like to refer to myself and to the program as a holistic program. Not holy like we're going to pray about it before we start, but holy as in complete. We're going to work on the whole system, hence the evaluation. We're going to break you down into tiny little bite-sized chunks so that you've got something that you can actually achieve and something you can target and something you can actually watch the improvement of. If you start a weight loss program to lose weight, then there's only one way you know if you, it's working or not working. And that's if you lose weight and you get to decide that at the end of 12 weeks. If you're plotting health, you might find a lot of the things you've come to solve get solved in the first week. And then you don't have to come back again. Which uh, I, the, the thing about Better Life and about weight loss and about diets, the reason you didn't all buy a banting book and bant, although many of you have, please don't do a show of hands. But some have tried, some haven't, some have checked. We all have an opinion. Um, and you're all right. The, weight loss can never be about food. Health can never just be about food. But we do know that a lot of the problems we have in the 21st century 
are nutritional. They are from what we eat. So we want to talk about those and I want to show you sort of how to identify what is a health problem because I need medication, what is a health problem because I need to change my lifestyle. And there's surprisingly more that you can do with your lifestyle than you probably think. Um, we know, I've kind of got a lot of information that I don't know it's important. You know, I really try to scare people uh, sometimes into doing the right thing. I find that tactic doesn't work, you know. But we want to talk about the types of foods you're going to eat. I'm going to talk about the things that you're exposed to, what kind of chemicals are in the environment, in your water, in your food. What are you eating? I want to talk about exercise and do we need to start exercising to lose more weight? Good news for those of you who are waiting for that lecture. Uh, we're going to talk about how food is produced, where it comes from, what is in our food. I'm going to expose some things with you um, about what your food, what your plate actually is made up of. Even though it looks like green stuff and yellow stuff and meat stuff from different animals, when you track your food back you'll be surprised if you go, well what did this thing eat, where did it get it, where did that come from, what was put on it, what was used to farm it, what did they use to plant it, what was the soil like that they planted it in. Each stage makes a difference in the eventual outcome of the food that you eat. And we don't even think about that. Um, we want to talk about the amount of sugar that we eat, we want to talk about the stress that we live under, and we want to talk about how we manage the stress that we, that we live with and how we manage it. Uh, the sleep at the bottom, not unimportant at all. Sleep is a surprisingly simple way to change many things and there is a sleep weight loss program. So, that's not ours, relax, wake up. So, <coughs> there, there's a doctor overseas who does only two things for his patients. He tells them to eat foods that make you hot and to sleep 10 hours a day. And you do that until you've achieved your goal. I don't know how much you can charge people for that. It feels like a bit of a ripoff. But if he's making money out of telling people to sleep, he's cleverer than any of us in this room. So respect for that guy. And we'll talk a bit about why that actually works. Because he's, he's onto something. He's onto something really, really important that a lot of us have forgotten. So one of the things we're going to talk about as we don't talk about food all the time is we're going to talk about behavior. We're going to talk about behavior patterns. We're going to talk about habits, how to break them, how to make new ones. We're going to talk about our children and why they're all hyperactive. We're going to talk about our adults and why we're all on antidepressants. Why adults are coming to me more and more and more to get stimulants like Ritalin and Concerta. So not only now are the children all on Ritalin, a third of our children, but even our adults feel they need things to boost their energy, stimulants, caffeine. Lucky for us, we've got alcohol. The kids don't, don't shame, they don't even have that. So, uh, after 60 years of treating cholesterol, we've, we've made a very horrible discovery that nobody's, we, we haven't extended the lifespan of these people with cholesterol yet. And so we, we have to ask the questions about what we're doing and we have to challenge myths and we have to challenge bad science. And you don't have to do it. I've done that, other people have done that that are cleverer than me, and I'm going to tell you what they did. And we're going to decide together if they're right or they're wrong. What else are we going to tell you? We're going to tell you that we know one in three of, this people, of people in this room will die of a heart attack. But this is an interesting little statistic. How many of you think Adam and Eve or one of their kids probably died of a heart attack? When do you think heart attacks started? When did they start to exist? It's always interesting for me to sort of realize that heart attacks have only been around for 103 years. Officially, first diagnosis. Eish, this thing is not good. Heart attack. It wasn't diagnosed in Africa and that was really a horrible sort of racial slur. Apologies. <coughs> so the thing is, heart attacks have not been killing us for generations. They've been killing us for two or three generations. So some important questions must be asked by our generation who with everything that we have, have not been able to fix that yet. 100 years later, and we still die of heart attacks in numbers. Um, spastic colon. If I had to get everybody in this room who has an irritable bowel syndrome or a spastic colon to stick up their arm, it would smell <coughs> nasty. <in there. laughs> Everybody's dying of cancer. Well, we've got to die of something, no? Okay? But what I'm going to actually show you over the next 12 weeks is you get to pick your disease. If you, if you pay a little bit extra, I'll even try and tell you the date, which is just a little thing we do uh, with a ball. <clears throat> but 64% of our population is overweight. We need to address this because the truth is 64% of our people are going to die of things they didn't need to die of. 
and they're going to die, die 10, 20, 30, 40 years sooner than they needed to die. And, you know, nobody, have you noticed when you go to a funeral, the only person who's not crying is actually dead in the front. Because when you're dead, you don't care. So we're not really scared of dying. We're certainly not scared enough. But we are scared of not dying slowly, badly, strokes, heart attacks, medications, dependent, people helping us bath, go to the toilet, sleep, can't walk, locked in a room, old age home. Anybody scared of that? Uh, if you're not yet, we can talk more about it. But we, m none of us wants that stuff, and it's, it's stuff that we can do something about. Um, so this was a statistic that I based this on. It was a 2010 statistic done in the USA. We also had our own one in South Africa. But basically, they showed that eight out of 10 deaths in this current world in which we live, our environment, are caused by lifestyle-related issues. And we might touch on that if we have time. But that's a lot of people that didn't have to die of that. All right. So we did some diabetes statistics last week. I told you how much it costs and how scary it is. It's going to cost the world's population. Uh, it's an interesting thing. Now, we, we're not scared of heart attacks, but how many people are scared to ride their bicycles on the street? Yet your chance of being knocked over and killed is 0.0005%. So it's far safer to be on a bicycle than it is to have diabetes. And it's far, 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 0.0.0.0.0. But how many people are scared of a shark when you go and swim in the sea? When you can see your knees, you're okay. When you can't see your hips, you start to look. When you're swimming like this, you know they're following you. So it's amazing how scared we are of these things that are probably never going to happen to even anybody that we know. And yet this stuff, we don't care. This is going to knock years, decades of our lives. It's going to kill the quality of our lives, and we don't spend a minute thinking about it, because while we don't got it, then we don't care about it. And so I'm here to be the happy messenger of great joy to remind you, you're going to get this. So what are we going to tell you about your food? Some of you have done the course before. I haven't changed this too much, because food's very basic, and a lot of people talk about food as though they know what it is. So we talk about things called macronutrients, the big stuff in your food, the make it makes it look like something, taste like something, smell like something. Fiber, carbohydrates, fat. There are a couple of things in there that we've become aware of. How long do you think we've known about vitamins? Is it 400 years? 300 years? 200 years? Anybody? Anybody? 80 years. That's when we discovered, hey, there's something here. Okay, good. It's, it's a Dutch person who lived a little bit in, in Australia. So. He, th there was somebody who actually discovered vitamins 80 years ago. Before that, we just ate it because we thought it tasted nice. We didn't realize the damage we do to food when we change the food. We had no idea. As little as 20 years ago, we discovered another whole class of chemicals where we started to understand what we call phytochemicals. 20 years ago. That means all of us in this room were born. All of us. There was one that was close, but she assured me that she's over 21. Two, five. Look, you look amazing. <laughs> so we, we, we are learning about our food. There's another whole section here that I can't add yet because we haven't discovered it yet. Because there's got to, if this is what we discovered 80 years ago, and that's what we discovered 20 years ago, what's the chances that we understand everything about food? I would imagine naught. And I think a lot of the problem with the food we have is we still don't understand food. And one of the areas that's emerging about food that we will talk about is the energy of food. The, the difference that it makes eating something that's alive. And I'm not talking about like a cat or something. But living, whole, complete, fresh, as opposed to eating something that's old, stored, processed, or changed. There's something else we don't understand yet. And we'll get to some of that too. So we, we found all these things. They were lying around. We used to pick them. We used to hunt them. We used to eat them. Depending on where we lived, we used to eat them depending on the season in which we picked them. Then we started to change them because we had to carry them. We had to feed bigger groups of people. We had to move things across oceans. We had to farm. We had to get convenient. We liked to pour things out of boxes. We wanted more taste, more sweetness. We wanted 
things not to be chewy. We wanted things to cook in two minutes, then one minute, then 20 seconds. We actually want it cooked before we look at it. Those are the best ones. So we smoke it. Isn't that the best idea ever? So we get the chickens to run around on hot coals so that they like smoke before they even get to the abattoir. <laughs> so I thought of that. If that ever happens, it's mine. <laughs> so um, you have to do like intense psychology with them. It's like, it's not hot. It's not hot. It's not burning. It's not burning. <laughs> okay. So then we, we take some fat. We add a little bit of fat to some food because we just like the way it tastes. We get rid of phytochemicals because they're bitter and they don't taste nice and they don't keep. It makes your food rot. So we get rid of it. We get rid of vitamins, minerals, enzymes. As soon as we heat something, as soon as we freeze something, as soon as we store something, these things get destroyed. We get rid of fiber because it makes things chewy. It makes things slow to cook. And it, it, fiber, it tastes like wood. Not anybody's favorite. We like our carbohydrates. In fact, we love our carbohydrates. Our favorite carbohydrate is sugar. But almost all the food we eat is carbohydrate based. Uh, and, and this is one of the areas we will talk about and they will be crying at that point. We, we like a bit of protein because protein gives structure and shape and form. Then we compressed everything into something that I've eventually just called new food. And the food we eat today is food that you buy in your shop that has come from somewhere you have no idea when. That doesn't matter what time of the year you've eaten it. It's all year round. Anything you feel like. And relatively cheap. No. Uh, we tend to base our decisions on price rather than quality. One of my favorite moments as a young married person was walking down pick and pay and an aisle and my wife had sent me, Sharon, my wife, I'll tell our story, <laughs> and she'd sent me down to go and buy a tin of tuna and I looked back and I said, which one must I buy? That's a normal thing you can shout to people in a supermarket. Which one must I buy? They weren't cell phones. Now you're just like... <laughs> and her answer to me was, it doesn't matter, just take the cheapest. <laughs> Which is not something you shout down an aisle in a supermarket where people are. So, because we didn't really think that made a difference. It's food. It's going to fill the same spot. So we're going to eat it and we will feel good. There will be joy. There will be a short fight. But there will be joy after the tuna. Anyway, let's talk about carbohydrates. Have you ever uh, come across any of these things? Potatoes, rice, these are the big boys that we're going to talk about a lot. We're going to be nasty. Because these things have become our staple foods. There are entire civilizations that have grown up on rice, potatoes, millies, and then the ubiquitous wheat and grains. Wheat, what an amazing food. It changed the face of the earth. It could be farmed, it could be harvested, it could be stored, it could be transported. It can be made into any one of a million things. It doesn't taste too bad if you get rid of the good stuff in the wheat. So wheat has just taken over our world. And so because of that, a lot of attention was paid to wheat. So 50, actually 60 years ago now, but that's how long we've been doing this course. So 10, since I started the course, our wheat changed. The way that it gets grown changed. Genetic engineering started to happen. They changed. They, do you know how genetic engineering is very scary? Because they use the, the genetic material of bacteria and they implant it into the seed so that basically the seed becomes part of a, another living creature's bacteria. So basically we just eat germs. Have you heard of wheat germ? It's, <laughs> Okay, maybe not. Don't quote everything you hear here. Just check with me first. Okay. It's, it's going to get easier as you go along. You'll see, I do have this little smile, just this side that goes, not being serious. But uh, you'll have to watch it. Okay, so when we talk about carbohydrates, this is the main group I'm referring to. There's only five. It's very easy to remember. Um, millies, potatoes, rice, oats. It's kind of the things that you're going to miss the most. That's the easy way to remember it. Okay. Then we talk about another group of foods. Why did that do that? Oh, what about carbohydrates? So we talked a little bit about that. They taste nice, they're staples, we eat them. Proteins, what are the proteins that we know? Well, proteins are meaty foods. Proteins come from the animals primarily, and this is, this is definitely one of our favorite kinds of foods. Uh, the thing with proteins is, uh, 
They contain high omega-6s because the proteins we eat these days are from farm-grown animals who are not pasture-fed. They're eating foods we feed them, millies, lucerne, wheat, leftovers. So a lot of grain fed, which was promoted by, do you remember there were ad series, Checkers used to have an ad about the meat and how juicy it is because it's grain fed cattle. We should have just sued them all, except that it did taste really good. Uh, our animals are fed lots of antibiotics, I'm going to tell you why. Why are the animals fed antibiotics? Do they sneeze a lot? Is there a lot of flu on the farms? Do they not get vaccinations? Is it just really cold at night because they don't have roofs? Well, I'll tell you why they get antibiotics, and it's quite scary. We get a lot of those in. They get growth hormones because, you know, it used to be almost four to five years to have a cow from calf to go to be slaughtered. We've got that down to about 18 months, which, don't worry, I know, I get it. We're trying to do it quicker. But uh, so far, we're down to 18 months. Chickens can be turned around in under 20 days. So we can make stuff like this. We literally have food factories. And the problem with those food factories is they contain living creatures. And let's just all hope that God's not like a cow or a chicken or something. One depends on what you believe, okay? <coughs> uh, I stopped to just make sure everyone's okay with that. <laughs> Are we good? Okay, so he probably isn't, okay? So again, just don't quote that. Um, what's the other very interesting thing about protein? Do you know that it takes about 18 kilograms of organic materials to produce one kilogram of meat? So that's how much, on average, your cow has to eat 18 kilograms to produce one kilogram. It's a very uh, inefficient system of raising food. So 18 kilograms of wheat would keep you going for quite a long time, but it doesn't keep a cow going very long. There's a thing about cancer risk that we'll talk about, but that's just to scare you a little bit. Ooh, proteins. Okay, I think that's finished. Thank you. Now we've got another whole group we want to talk about, and this is our fats. So we used to kind of ignore this, and we used to say, but this is just part of uh, proteins, no? Because if you have an animal, then it has proteins, and then the animal will have fat. But we've been taught for 50 years, cut the fat off, don't do fat, eat the low fat, get rid of the fat, because fat causes cholesterol to go up and cholesterol causes us to die of heart attacks. Except remember from my first slide that after 60 years of eating like this, we haven't changed the statistics at all. So we have to ask the important questions. And I'm going to ask those with you. These things have become important. There was a time you didn't eat nuts because they were so fatty, high fat. So Weight Watchers, Wayless, they take these away from you. Coconuts, well, I mean, that was just weird. Avos, uh, but when else did you try and buy coconut oil in the shop? Suddenly, it's everywhere, isn't it? We'll tell you why, because you'll be fighting in that queue, I'm afraid. Uh, avos. Remember when you weren't allowed to eat avos? Then you were allowed it, but then you were only allowed to eat half an avo. So good luck trying to figure that out. Butter, cheese. These are the foods that are made from the fats of the dairy. So they're different from dairy. They're different from protein. This is what's left when milk settles out. Uh, you get curds, whey. Fat, protein, casein, uh, and, and we make fatty things from it. We'll talk a bit about that. Eggs is probably, now here's a scary thing. We've all been scared of eggs and we've been told only eat so many eggs per week. If you watch the news at all, you'll see some of us are starting to challenge that. We have looked at the science that decided this thing. And we've seen but the tests that they did on the eggs were done on rabbits. And I don't know how many of you have ever seen an, a rabbit eating an egg. It's really doesn't happen and so based on the fact that rabbits who ate eggs got cholesterol which caused blocking of the arteries we decided that eggs are really bad because of the cholesterol and because of the fat and they block your arteries and give you heart attacks because obviously lots of rabbits die of heart attacks and uh, oh, it's not like you know who's even a vet here you see that, so because of the rabbits nah, we were told we can't eat eggs but rabbits don't even eat eggs it's not their natural food. They don't eat fat. They don't eat meat. So, I mean, is it, a, is it an accident that to this day we refer to diet food as rabbit food or bunny food? No. So we can't do that anymore. Now we refer to the rabbit because now we eat the rabbit. <laughs> so, but not the ones that have had heart attacks. Okay, none of that's true again. <laughs> are we keep, are we, you're going to learn this, hey? We're getting there. So, 
I remember when I first started doing this course, people would just look at me a bit weird, like, oh, but uh, doctors tell jokes like that. It's a bit weird. So some of them aren't good at all, so I don't mind if you laugh at me or with me. It's just enjoy it. Try and keep up. So eggs basically are now the ultimate food. Now that we've decided we're not going to feed them to rabbits anymore, they are now the ultimate food. They contain proteins, they contain fantastic types of fats, a very nice blend of saturated, unsaturated, polyunsaturated fats. It's everything you need is in this egg. The shell's not so good, so don't worry, we're not going to challenge that yet. But stick with us, bet your life 2015, uh, 2025. I'm pretty sure it's going to, something's going to come in there. Uh, so we're not scared of eggs, and we're not scared of the fat in the eggs, we're not scared of the cholesterol in the eggs, and we'll tell you later on why. Uh, one of our theories is that fat we don't believe anymore causes heart disease. Ah, I can't explain everything tonight, just take it, just take it. Like, what? I've heard a bit of this. I was hoping this wasn't going to be one of those. Uh, is that what's going through your mind? Have you all paid? Sorry, before I get too far into this. So, Triggers, uh, fats make us feel really satisfied. When you eat fat, you feel good. When you look fat, though, you don't feel good. We, but that's different. Um, when, when we used to live in caves, now none of you were born yet, but let's say our grandparents, then they used to eat, they used to hunt, they used to eat loads of meat and butter and you, your granny used to just drop the butter into the vegetables and now you, t you used to moan at her. Remember when you started to moan at your granny because you can't put so much butter in there. You can't put the butter in the gem squash because gem squash, actually I just thought it was a little holder for butter. But <laughs> <laughs> then we like moaned at our poor grannies. Stop doing that. Now we like, if only she was here. Um, we know that there's a, a, the way that the energy of the fat is absorbed into your system is completely different from the way that sh the energy from sugar and carbohydrates is absorbed into your system. And insulin is a very important part of that. We're going to talk about that. Uh, your body doesn't experience the stress levels, and we can talk about stress. That's going to be a nice, interesting conversation we're going to have. We're going to talk a little bit about vegetables. So here's the thing with vegetables. Are vegetables all amazing and, and safe? Are they just the most incredible invention ever? Well, no. So here's the good news for your children. Your children have been doing our diet for years already. Because when they say, I don't want that, because I don't know why everybody speaks funny like that. But I don't want that. So then you listen to them. You say, my child, you are blessed with wisdom from the gods. Thou shalt not eat these little trees, which I've tried many times to deliver by little aeroplanes into your mouth. But <laughs> stuff tastes horrible. When you're young, you have twice as many taste buds on your tongue as an adult. So it tastes twice as bitter to your child as it does to you. You might remember a time when you didn't like olives. Now you kind of do. You didn't like spinach. Now you don't mind it. You didn't like pumpkin. No, it tastes like nothing. You drank your dad's wine and thought, that's it. Not only am I never drinking this stuff, but I'm going to become a nun. <laughs> Which was weird for my mom, first real coming out experience. But um, anyway, so vegetables are not all good across the board. There are some vegetables that are way better for us than others. We'll talk about that more. Uh, this is the general thing about vegetables. They are very nutritious. They are very cheap. They are unprocessed. They are unsweetened. They are nutrient dense, and that's why we will talk about them. Uh, they contain um, all the minerals we need, all the vitamins we need, all the phytonutrients we need. We'll talk more, a lot more about vegetables because vegetables are becoming the thing to talk about now. Uh, something, we had to add something to the list because we've run out of other stuff now. So now we decided to pick on fruit and vegetables. Fruits are awesome. They contain so many things that we need. But does that mean we need to eat lots of fruit? We have made possibly some mistakes in telling people fruit is fine. Do as much as you like. We already realized the mistake we made with fruit juice. By giving our children 100% fruit juice, which on the side of the box is 6%. Have you done that? Have you ever read that? 606. So it's all, the whole box is full. That's 100%. It's full of juice, which is 6% juice. <laughs> which, even though it says orange, is actually grape or apple. Have you kept 100% orange juice, but it's mostly grape or apple. 
So the 100% that is orange juice is orange juice, but the other 99% is not. Uh, do you get how that works now? McDonald's is the same. We'll talk about them. <laughs> Anyway, so is all fruit good for us? Can we just eat and drink as much fruit and fruit juice as we like? Probably not, and we're going to talk about that. There will be much crying on that day too. Uh, we do like a lot of things about fruit, but this is one of the little problems with fruit. It's something that slipped through unnoticed through the system because we used to think it's a healthy, low glycemic index sugar. It doesn't affect you like sugar, sucrose, that you eat table sugar. But we've discovered some nasty little things about fructose. It's the cousin that will probably end up in jail if it keeps on going this way. Have you got that cousin? We all have that cousin. You know, you knew it when it was small, though. <laughs> um, high glycemic index, micronutrients, minerals, vitamins. So very nutritious. It's got a lot of stuff in it. But it still doesn't mean we can just have it as much as we like. Okay, what are we talking about here? Here's some newer things, new kids on the block. So new they still sprouts. <laughs> this is Brussels sprouts. Remember, the usual reaction to Brussels sprouts is, ugh. So that's your granny's fault, no? Not enough butter. <laughs> but these are exceptionally nutritious little vegetables. Now, the English caught on to that for some reason. And if you're ever in England at Christmas time, there are Brussels sprouts wherever you go. Barrels full of them. They're rolling off the sides of stuff. You can like water ski on barrels of Brussels sprouts. You don't have to eat those afterwards. But sprouts contain something completely unique. They use the sugars in the food to grow. So by the time you're eating a sprout, you're using something that's highly nutritious, protein-rich, omega-3 rich with a very, very low sugar because the sugar's been used to grow. So it's low carbohydrate. It's got natural fiber, loads of it. And you can just, these things just grow and grow. Some of them grow into trees. You might have heard of them, seeds. And so each one of these little things is power packed full of nutrients. So we get that when we eat them. These little things you can buy. When else did you see woolies and pick and pay? You can buy little troughs of things, wheatgrass and stuff like that, that grows, that, whose name I can't tell you now. Here's another thing we're going to talk about. How many of you have heard of kombucha tea? Or what's the sauerkraut, fermented foods? Now, the fermented foods is not the ones you throw out of the fridge because it smells a bit funny. These are the ones you actually eat because you say, yes, at last it's properly fraught. <laughs> but these are, this is an ancient way, before they were fridged, this is how food used to be preserved. It used to be fermented. They discovered that if they ferment something in a controlled fashion, underwater, uh, with the right environment, right amount of light, right amount of heat, you can actually preserve something in a warm environment. So I think this was a very, very useful thing hundreds of years ago. It relies on very active bacterial growth. But the bacteria in here are harmless to human beings. If anything, they provide a benefit to us. And we drink, we drink this by the gallon at work. Okay, we don't really. But we do make it, just so we can show people, look, there's our kombucha. I, I don't like it. But my wife loves it. It's got a soury apple taste it's made with tea and honey and green tea and rooibos. And you can flavor it with different juices. A uh, very interesting drink, very, very healthy. And we'll talk about other foods that you can ferment. You can ferment milk. You can ferment water, which is kind of weird. I'm still looking for that one. Water, water kefir, anybody? Got some? So you can put kefir, it's a grain, it's a bacteria and it's a yeast and you put it in water and it, change, it flavors your water. Bacteria flavor. Actually, probably bacteria poo flavor. <laughs> Whatever. Let's not, uh, let's not use up all the jokes tonight. So uh, what else do we need to know about Bet Your Life? I kind of, I'm going to show you a few pictures of how the program goes, but the pictures, things have changed a bit faster, so maybe they don't all represent all the truth. But you'll notice a few common themes in the, on this plate of food. You'll look, it looks juicy, it looks whole, um, nothing's come out of cans. It might have come out of a packet, but it didn't come out of a can. It contains foods which might contain high amounts of the bad fats, saturated fats. These are ostrich steaks. Lots of cheeses, very natural, very bright, very colorful plates of food. We're going to eat foods that look a little bit like salads with not tons of, you know when we eat and you ask your wife, what's for supper tonight? Does she ever say stewed carrots? 
Do you stew carrots? What do you do with carrots? Boil, fr uh, wait, I've got it, steamed carrots. Does anybody tell their husband, we're having steamed carrots? Because you won't have a husband very long. <laughs> so what you tell him, we're having lamb tops. We're having chicken, big, greasy. It was, it's organic chicken, because a happy chicken. <laughs> so we like happy food, happy food. Uh, have you ever seen a chicken smile? It looks like this. Yeah, it's exactly the same. You can't, it, you really can't see that. I'm sorry. Don't even try. Maybe Google it. So, um, that's why you can't really tell. That's why they're so nice to kill. Moving right along, do you see the portions are very small? You know why the portions are small? Because the energy contained in this piece of fish is so much that most of us will not perform in one day enough activity to burn up the energy contained in that piece of fish. And we're going to learn a little bit about energy management. Because many of us, as we sit here now, are burning 170 kilojoules per hour. It's nearly nothing. By breathing, by thinking. When you laugh, it might go up to 185. If you stand up when you laugh, at the standing ovation at the end of the show, the talk, the course, uh, you will use. But you will very seldom use more energy than is in that piece of fish, interestingly enough. Here's another little example. There's some sprouts in there, a healthy little salad sprinkled with some beef cubes or something. Just in case you were starting to get worried, you've noticed no carbohydrates so far. One has survived and we've kept a bit of brown rice in your first two weeks. Now, we don't hate carbohydrates. So let me just say it's for the people who are starting to get nervous. You are sweating partly because of your nervousness and partly because I don't think the air con's on. But we don't hate carbohydrates, but we're going to show you how carbohydrates work. I want you to understand carbohydrates. There is a time for carbohydrates and there's a time not for carbohydrates. Important to know the difference. Breakfast, some very essential components missing, like the toast. Funny enough, you know when we started this program five and a half years ago and I showed people a picture like this, they're like, yeah, that looks weird because where's the toast? Okay, but what about rye bread? That's better, that's healthy bread. Uh, or whole wheat, because that's better than white bread. And I was the weird guy. Then Tim Noakes comes along, makes me disappear and into meaninglessness. But now we all kind of like, oh, okay, yeah, we are, that's our breakfast, Doc. We just have eggs, that's how we eat now. So it's become very mainstream. A lot of people do this, a lot of people try this. We talk about paleo, banting, and we're gonna talk about a few more. All right. So let's talk about evaluating yourselves. So I'm gonna, th this is a lot of detail. Now the reason I've put a lot of detail on the slides is just to show you how many things we have to consider when we talk about becoming healthier, changing our lifestyles, and or losing weight. It's not just about buying the book. So I'm not gonna go through this at great length because it will take a long time. And this will be, these are essentially the questions that will be on the evaluation form that you have. The ladies, you cannot believe how much of a role your hormones play. And there's a few ways I can pick out if it is your hormones that are messing you around, that are changing either your appetite, your cravings for sugar, sweets, chocolates, your inability to lose weight, your gaining weight even when you just drink water. Uh, you, there's a lot of little clues that can tell me where the problem lies. Imbalance of hormones is a massive problem, partly because we've convinced all of you that you need to be on contraceptives from the age of 12, so that you don't get acne and never have babies. And it's created a small problem, which we will talk about. The thyroid, always important. Unfortunately, not as big a factor as we used to think. People always ask me, when they're tired or they're overweight, they ask me if I have a thyroid problem. So here's the answer, yes. See, I saved you all a thousand rand. If you want to pay it though, that's fine. We will have a credit card machine. But, but yes, you have an under-functioning thyroid. If you weren't sure, if you're not convinced, you do. But not because there's something wrong with your thyroid. And I'm going to show you about how that works and why your thyroid's become overactive. <coughs> but from the day you start gaining weight, or struggle to lose it, or lose it and regain it, or lose it and regain it again, you have a thyroid problem. And we're going to show you how to kick that back into gear. 
Your adrenal glands are two little organs that sit above your kidneys that medicine as a whole hardly ever speaks about. You know a lot of organs in your body, but have you ever heard of anybody who's got an adrenal infection? You're, uh, you know, uh, did you know that you can have problems with the adrenals? You can have infections, inflammations, you can have a disease called adrenalitis. You can have adrenal fatigue. Some of us have heard of that. Then. You can have adrenal failure. But you can have massive problems with these little glands. And what's crazy about these little glands is they look like two little puppies sleeping on our kidneys. They look like they're doing nothing. And let me help you with that. For many of us, they are doing nothing. So we're going to show you how to work those puppies up. And there's lots of ways for me to know. Is your problem related to your energy and which part of your system is preventing your body from experiencing the energy and which part of your body is, is preventing you from gaining life, energy and losing weight? At the end of the day, we're going to prove to you that healthy people become thin people. Healthy people have a system that functions as a unit. And an interesting little story I'll tell uh, uh, when, when people come to me for functional medicine, the long consultations, one of the stories I do tell is the story of an orchestra. The orchestra works like this. You can have a room full of the most talented musicians in the world ready to play you a song. But if you tell each musician in the room, when I tap the baton on the podium, I want each of you to start playing your favorite song in the whole world and go, and everybody plays. The most talented artists in the world each start playing their own favorite song. It will sound like the worst noise you've ever heard. Because the sum doesn't make up the whole if it's not coordinated. That's why there's a little man with a stick. They took his violin away. <laughs> now he's got a stick. But when he points at you, he, he does something that we have forgotten how to do. He coordinates. He listens. He closes his eyes. He doesn't have to watch and see. He can close his eyes and he can feel. So when you play, the first thing he's going to try to get you to do is all play off the same song sheet, to play the same tune. Now, interestingly enough, in an orchestra, even though you're playing off the same tune, you're not all playing at the same time. Because when you play is as important as when you stop. You can't keep playing. You can't even keep playing at the same volume. Each of those things makes a difference. So he's got to make sure that you're all playing off the same sheet, at the same rhythm, starting when you should, stopping when you should, at the right volume that you should. Then he can close his eyes, and then he can hear, that one's coming in early, that one's out of tune, this beat is wrong. He can pick out the little tunes the little problems that are happening. He doesn't have to go up to you, he doesn't have to interview, he doesn't have to do tests. He can feel it, he can hear it. And that's how your body works. And I'm gonna to try to teach you to be that conductor over the next 12 weeks, so that we can at least start getting all the organs to play the same tune. So we can start to pick out where's the problem, where's the breakdown, where's the little, little, little thing that's causing the whole thing to sound like a noise. Medication plays a huge role. A lot of you have spent many years at your doctor being convinced of your disease. You have this. It is incurable. You will have to use this for the rest of your life. It's not unusual for us to do that. How many of our old people, our, our parents, our grandparents go to the doctor, they've got six different tablets they take every day, and I've had a patient who said to me, you know, he takes all those tablets, but he's old. So that means you're supposed to. No? But you're not supposed to. Most of the tablets we use, 80% of the tablets, that you will use in your life having been invented in the last 50 years. So what did people use before that? Were they, it was just dumb luck. They used to chew on grape leaves and stuff. So are we just the first generation that's blessed to have all this amazing medication? Or is there something really wrong with us that we think we need to be on piles of medicine that's none of it more than 50 years old to stay alive? Problem. So these things mess us up, and one of the things that mess us up the most is that they help us to believe that we are sick and that we are incurable. And your doctor has helped you do that too. He doesn't know, so he's not being mean. He just actually doesn't know. Boys, we've got as many hormone problems as the girls, but at least they don't come in cycles. So <laughs> we've been let off the hook on that one. We don't have to have the kids. Amazing. And I reckon getting off breastfeeding is quite good too. But 
We develop our problems, but our problems start more subtly. They start slower and they work up and they work up. And you know where they might be found? In the pub on a Friday night after a few doubles of something. Because a man takes his feelings out in a different way. He doesn't come to the doctor and say, I just don't feel well. <laughs> I'm still waiting for that consultation. Oh, I'm just not feeling myself and um, I get this pain here. Um, the, we don't. I've just been, I need to explore my feelings. Um, I just don't feel like I've found myself after all these years. And oh, there's that other thing about um, I don't get erections anymore. That's normally what they tell you as they leave the door. <laughs> as they're about to go, uh, and why did I come? Uh, why, doctor, I don't get erections anymore? <laughs> so you must be careful of that because now all my staff know why you came to. <laughs> So boys, we've got big problems, and part of it is that we keep stuff bottled up. We don't try stuff. We die. We die of heart attacks while the chicks watch. <laughs> and we're very irresponsible because we don't care or we don't know or we don't talk. Who knows why? Toxins is something I spend a bit of time on because we can't, I think uh, one of the quotes that we talk about is that in a baby's blood, if we draw blood from a newborn baby's umbilical cord, we can find in that blood 284 man-made chemicals on the day of your birth. Chemicals that did not exist 200 years ago, 100 years ago. They have come in through the mother. The other problem is that we've been taught to eat sugary foods, carbohydrates. We grow up on carbohydrates. We have wheat picks in the morning and we have sandwiches for lunch and we have pasta for supper and our body secretes insulin and insulin and insulin. And last week I was at a conference and he said, so basically we spend nine months marinating our children in insulin. And then we're surprised when they only like Coke and bread and chips and sweets and ice cream. And that's what they were taught to like. We want to talk about all the different things we're exposed to because they do affect us. You know, I have people who lose weight just because we change, we take their fillings out. How cool is that diet? The let's take your fillings out diet. We don't do it here. There's new carpets. <laughs> we want to talk about foods that make you sick. This is another reason you can't just start changing the way you eat or get special recipe books and say, from now on, we're going to eat like this. If your body doesn't break the food down properly, if it doesn't digest the food properly, if it doesn't absorb the food properly, if you don't have the bacteria living in your gut to break that food down properly, it's not going to get into you. It's not going to fix you. It's not going to keep you healthy. So you need to understand what makes you sick in the food that you eat. And a lot of these things are fixable. So you know we live in a, situ uh, a situation where everybody, it's become a joke. We think everybody's gluten intolerant. In America, everyone's gluten intolerant. And they are now. But were they always? Is that the reason why they're overweight? No, we'll talk about that too. I'm going to talk about your immune system. I'm going to talk about diseases that you have that you didn't think had anything to do with the food that you eat. Uh, psoriasis, arthritis, lupus, colons, thyroid, diabetes. These are caused by problems in your gut. Your psychology. Who thought that your depression might be because of the food that you eat? Uh, comfort eating we know about. So there is this. We, these are little excuses we use. But often these have been caused by things that you do. Not necessarily just your bad habits. Uh, insulin, what's your body doing to the food that you have? What does the food look like that you're eating? A lot of us can be better just by changing what, it, what we have and what we put on our plates. So we're going to talk about the foods that cause cravings. We're going to talk about foods that make you sick, cause habits that are addictive, that fatten you, that stimulate you, that are processed, that are sugary, that are toxic foods like alcohol and coffee. And we're going to try to find out what it is that you shouldn't be eating. Initially, we take it away. We let you heal. When you healed, when you well, then we try reintroducing things that you thought you couldn't have before. But maybe when you're healthy and well, you can. So important to talk about that. You've got three weeks to make the switch to your new lifestyle. In our lifestyle program, there can be no cheating. There can be no mistakes. You can never, ever do anything wrong even if you don't do what I asked you to do. So it's a good diet. Um, 
I'm going to ask you for a before photo. We used to take before photos, but they used to look horrible. So I want the photograph that you've looked at that made you go, uh, yuck. I don't want to look like that. We all have that photograph. Maybe some of us don't. Maybe you were looking at your husband. Uh, I don't want to look at that. <laughs> <laughs> but I want the photograph that made you go, this is wrong. This cannot carry on like this. I need to do something. So get that photo. It's an important photo to have. I'm going to, um, he has an interesting one that few people did, but I'm going to ask to see these things. I want you to take a photograph of where you keep your food. Not the good food, the other food. <laughs> Maybe your fridge too. Because I want to show you, as part of your evaluation, how it will change over the next 12 weeks. Without you even realizing it, you'll start to see you're replacing things with healthier options. But the funny thing is that before, healthy means horrible. But now you're going to start choosing those things. It's going to be the things you prefer to eat. So I want a photo of you, and I want a photo of your food. I did think of actually asking you, you know there's this little problem of you open your cupboard and say, oh, but there's all this food. Okay, how about we finish this food first, and then we start the diet in 2017? Because let's admit it, we all have a little 7-Eleven going on at our homes. So, um, I want that food out of your cupboard. If you want to transition and change, you need to get rid of the stuff that you know is not helping you, that you know is bad for you. If you can't throw it away, put it in a bag. It will keep its highly processed crap. <laughs> keep it in the bag and put it in a cupboard or bring it to me. I'll give it to poor people that we don't like. <laughs> and you know, the people that threw poo in, in the airport, oh, they should get that food. Anyway, um, get rid of the stuff out of your cupboards. There is something very interesting. Any of us who've got children will remember the time you went to the shops and your children were, I want that, I want that, I want that, I want that. And eventually you thought they're going to stop breathing if they don't get that. So you buy it for them because we're incredibly bad parents. And then when you get home, he goes and does something and forgets completely about the thing that half an hour ago he was going to die without. The other thing, have you seen your children, how they fight over a toy or a video game or your phone? Until there's one better. Then the one they were going to kill each other for yesterday is lying over there. Now they're killing each other about a new one. So we are exactly like that. When you see stuff, you go, I'll have that. How many of you have been to a video shop? Then you go into the video shop and say, I want to see Terminator 3. I'm sorry, sir, we don't have Terminator 3. It is 2015. And then... Why are you in a video shop? There's box office. Okay, so uh, uh, if you don't have Terminator 3, then I'm leaving. Do, do any of you shop for videos like that? Maybe. But generally, you'll go and go, okay, this isn't, uh, you have to think back a little when we used to do this. W when you go to a video shop, you go, what do we feel like? What looks nice? What's new? What's interesting? You are going to leave that video shop with something, even if they haven't got the one that you chose. And it's the same with your fridge. You will take the nicest thing, the, near, the, the nearest to you sometimes, the most conveniently available thing, because it's there, not for any other reason. So these are the foods I want you to think about that you are not allowed to have as we process the next three weeks, as you transition into this program. So we're going to take away a lot of your drinks, unfortunately, for a while. We definitely have to take alcohol away, I'm afraid. So we take away foods, maybe they don't make you fat, but they change your behavior. <clears throat> we're going to take your caffeine, your teas, milks, drinks. We're going to take all the grains away. We're going to take all the dairy away for a while, except for one which we'll talk about. We're going to take your veggies your starchy vegetables, your potatoes, and your sweet potatoes. We're going to take your refined foods. So good luck finding that uh, the sweet diet. That, that diet didn't do very well at all. And then we're going to take away a few little extra interesting things. I want fruit out, vinegar out, pickled foods out, processed foods of any sort out, and beans out. Okay. So it looks like a lot of the things you used to live on you have already got it, don't you? You're going to get a copy of this. Yes. So before you leave, 
the green beans can stay, the baked beans can go. But later on, we'll have, have that talk again. But for now, green, green stuff you can do. Okay. Um, this is what you can have in this phase. You can have meats, venisons, you can have any of the meats, beef, lamb, pork, biltong. <coughs> the unprocessed belongs to the ham, not to the biltong. <laughs> Poultry, seafood. I really, really like seafood and I want you to explore seafood. These are vegetable uh, or plant proteins, tofu, corn, quinoa. Corn is like um, a, a kind of a mushroom. It's a... I forget what it's made of now, but it's a, <coughs> it's not meat, it's not plant, but it's a protein-rich food, similar to mushrooms. Vegetables, for the two to three weeks that we start the program, you can have any of the vegetables on that list. Salads, you can have as well, any on that list. So there's quite a lot of foods you can have. Remember, all the meats are there, all the fish is there. Then, <coughs> you are allowed eggs. Only the amount safe for a bunny. So, <laughs> unless you don't have bunnies, then you can have as many as you like. You can have them breakfast, lunch, and supper. You can have mushrooms. I've left brown rice in for the transition. If you are scared, you don't want to give up your carbs, you've tried it before, you didn't like it, there is a carbohydrate option, but I don't want you to have it with meat. I want you to have it by itself. You saw the picture earlier, it was like a brown rice stir fry. You can have it like that. You can have it as something between meals if you need. Because your body's gonna go into a kind of a shock if it hasn't already started. <coughs> I don't mind tomatoes and olives. I don't mind avo or coconut oil or almond or almond milk. MCT is a kind of an oil you get from coconuts. And I don't mind nuts to snack on. Preferably not salted nuts for this time because we tend to overeat salted nuts. Unless you're superhuman, salted nuts are yummy. So be careful of salted nuts. <clears throat> Don't skip meals, but only eat three times a day. Try to get to three. We'll talk about metabolism. I've had this conversation. What about six times? In the old days when we used to live on sugars, we used to eat more often. We don't have to if we eat right. I don't want you to eat late. This is a big problem for a lot of us, is we eat late. We eat our biggest meal late at night with alcohol. Um, drink lots of water. As much as you're comfortable drinking, there's no eight cups or 3%. Drink what you want, but drink more than you drink now. The fruit thing we'll talk about later. Um, if you have to have fruit, if you're dying for a piece of fruit or a fruit, don't drink fruit juice, but have the fruit well between the meals. But the less fruit you have, the better for now. You don't have to exercise on this program. In fact, if you are exercising, just keep doing what you're doing. Don't ramp it up. Don't try to lose weight by exercising. You will really struggle. You know that. We all know that. We've known that our whole lives. And yet somehow when we diet, we think we must exercise and eat less. And we're going to kick that theory out of the park. How much do you eat? That's the other thing. I'm not going to prescribe to you volume. I want you to eat the right amount for you. Eat as little as you can, but not so little that you're hungry later. Don't eat as much as you can just because I told you it's okay and we're not weighing it. Eat enough. <clears throat> you will find if you're doing this right that enough becomes smaller and smaller portions. If you want to snack between your meals in your transition phase, you can have meat any kind, built on. You can have eggs. You can have horrible celery sticks because <clears throat> that will make you feel healthy. Because when we eat green stuff, we do feel amazing. You can have natural live yogurts. Now, the one I like is Bulgarian, uh, Bulgarian yogurt. Okay, it's unsweetened and it contains uh, uh, a lactobacillus bulgaricus. It's an, a bacteria. That's why it's called Bulgarian yogurt. Did you know that? It doesn't come from Bulgaria. <laughs> it's named after the bacteria that they make it with. So tuna is also a nice thing. It's easy to have around. You can keep it. Uh, if you kept it in your car today, you can have fried tuna when you get home. <coughs> 
How are you going to cook your meals? You're going to steam it, you're going to grill it, you're going to bry it, you're going to braise it. The only one that I don't really like is deep frying it in plant or vegetable oils. I prefer fats from animal fats, I suppose that animal fats to prepare your food. Butter, ghee, if you don't know what that is, you can look it up. Lard, duck fat, duck fat, fat from animals. There's an interesting thing, we'll talk about the fats. Why fat from an animal cooks better than fat from a plant? It has to do with the heat and a thing called smoke point we'll talk about. Uh, you can drink almost anything you like that's on this list, which involves really different types of water. Be careful of waters that have got sweeteners in them. I don't like those waters. We want to try to move away from the need for sweetness. Try to find alternative sweeteners if you can't do without sugar then you can try stevia or you can try xylitol. Those are the only two sweeteners that I am okay with. And even those who want to try to move out. Stevia, xylitol. You can use a bit of honey, but even honey has got a lot of fructose in it. You've got to be careful with honey. For now. Okay. So we're going to be very strict because we want to get this thing going. And all of you want to get it going. And then we're going to ease up a little bit on it. After a few weeks, I'm going to start showing each of you a different way of eating. And we're going to test, as part of this group, a paleo diet, a banting diet, a Mediterranean diet, a food combining diet. So we're going to try different diets, and we're going to compete against each other to see who can do the best. I think that's kind of it. The good news is it does begin now. Now, I unfortunately tonight cannot stay for questions, but in future I will be available for questions. If you do have questions, ask my ladies, email us. Um, bring friends if you want. This video or DVD will be available. We're having a, some unfortunate problems with the computer, but this is normally available from two days after the lecture. So if you want to, if you miss one, you can get the DVDs. If you want to show somebody, you can buy the DVDs. We normally sell them for a deposit, which you get back when you bring back the DVD. Um, fill in your forms. If you want to fill it in now and leave it before you go, I would prefer that. The food list will be handed to you, so that whole list that I've shown you there will be there. Put it up on your fridge. That's what you're allowed to have. Take photos of your pantries. Take photos of yourselves. Take photos of your children. Take photos of yourselves. Did I say that? Yes. Okay. What did I miss out there? There's a photo I'm missing. The pantry. We did that. Take out the junk. Bring it to me. Or hide it in a cupboard. But get it out. If you like, take a before and an after of your pantry. I can almost guarantee it will be similar to your own before and after. That's it for tonight. Look forward to this thing. This is awesome, awesome. If you can get your mind into this thing, you can cook this thing. Thank you very much for being here, you guys.